Welcome to our first seminar of 2019, presented by the newly branded Workplace Law and Culture Team. Do you like that? Um, for those that I haven't met, my name is Amber Sharp and I'm one of the partners in the group. Uh, today we'll be having um, a panel format, so I may I introduce Darren Gardner and Ryan Murphy. We Hi. also have... <laughs> We also have, uh, because we are so modern, uh, webcasters who will be logging in as well. All right. Now, in other news, because we are so modern, we are actually having a poll facility. So can everybody see the details there? Pick up your handy smartphone. Not only turn the ringer off, but also log into this. So what can you expect this morning? Um, Basically, there will be some polls, but more about that later. But we will be talking about these particular topics. Now, the first one is artificial, tech, artificial intelligence. What we'll really be doing today is exploring some technology impacts that are shaping our current and future workplaces. What will the workplace actually look like in 10 to 20 years' time? One thing's for sure, and that is that it won't look the same as it does today. The world is changing at a pace that has never been seen before, and it will be interesting to see how the law keeps up with those changes in technology. So moving then to our topics, first up will be artificial intelligence. The gap is closing between the thinking capabilities of humans and machines. Scary, but true. What opportunities but also problems does this create for businesses and in particular human resources departments. Historically, corporations have been liable for the conduct of their employees. Will corporations be liable for the conduct of machines? What about when it comes to making decisions about hiring and firing? The next topic that we'll be talking about today is data mining. Now, everybody, I'm sure, in this room is guilty of Facebook stalking at some time, whether it is an ex-partner or a potential candidate. So, to what extent can social media, for example, be safely and legitimately used as a recruitment tool? Beyond social media, how much information are you allowed to obtain from potential job candidates? Then we will be moving to CCTV and workplace surveillance. Just to give you a bit of a headline about what some of the obligations are, and in particular we'll be looking at two issues, and that is the extent to which, for example, CCTV footage can be a useful evidentiary tool in unfair dismissal proceedings and the like, but also, to what extent is CCTV footage actually reliable in our modern world? Then we'll be moving to talk about smartphone um, devices, mobile smartphones. What they actually mean is that every employee has at their fingertip a camera, a telephone and a dictaphone. What does that actually mean for your business? and video camera, sorry, too true. And then finally, looking at the issue of biometrics. Um, will fingerprint scanning, for example, replace the Bundy clock? And are employers entitled to require employees to use that fingerprint scanning? So we're going to kick off with artificial intelligence. Um, just as a bit of an intro to this topic, um, it would be fair to say that artificial intelligence presents huge potential benefits in the workplace. A recent report by PwC finds that CEOs overwhelmingly say that AI will significantly impact their business in the next five years. So something in the range of 86% of CEOs express that view. And almost three quarters, or 73%, believe it will be good for society. The main issues that were identified in the report are these. Is AI 
unbiased? Is it fair? The next issue is AI interpretable, explainable and transparent? Is AI robust and secure? Is it appropriately governed? And is it legal, ethical and moral? So, a new frontier in AI is deep machine learning. Darren, what is it? Well, I, I thought I might start off with uh, this technology to work. Uh, <laughs> what is AI? And there's probably two different types of artificial intelligence to explain first. So, um, you might be familiar with the more, what's called narrow AI, which you, might have, you may be familiar with in terms of, it's those chat chatbots that sometimes help you get insurance or banking inquiries. Um, we're also seeing a slightly broader version of it in autonomous vehicles, so cars that can drive themselves. Um, there's also another category of AI which is called artificial general intelligence. Now that's something that's a little bit more theoretical but emerging. Um, that's the type of machine intelligence that thinks like we do. So it's capable of um, engaging in complex cognitive thought processes to come up with solutions. So um, and where Amber prompted me was on the idea of deep machine learning, which is a, an exploration of this general artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, for example, uh, we've got, uh, there's some hospital systems now in the United States that have been built to basically plough through enormous um, databases of patient records to actually look at patterns in, and, and remarkably, these deep machine learning systems have discovered patterns that human doctors have not discovered before in, in diagnosing everything from uh, schizophrenia to particular types of liver cancer or, or uh, kidney cancers. So, um, but uh, quite spookingly, one researcher who helped build this system said, look, we can build the model, we just don't understand how it works yet. <laughs> Meaning, what this machine has done, without being given any rules, is it's taught itself how to diagnose conditions without people fully understanding it. That's the more spooky sort of direction of artificial general intelligence. Did anybody uh, ever watch the film? It was a 2001 film called Artificial Intelligence. Has anybody ever seen that? All right, what I'm about to do is show you a super creepy um, small clip from that and then get Darren to talk to it. Here we go. Honey, hand it to me. Look what I can do. Hello. Yes? Mrs. Swinton, could you hold a moment? I have an urgent call from your husband. Yes, I will. Uh, David, I, I need to talk to the phone now. Monica? Monica, can you hear me, Monica? Let the phone Monica? talk now. Can you Come hear on. me? Pick up the phone, Monica. Run along, please, Pick up Katie. the phone, Monica. Oh, my God, Monica. <laughs> so I, 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 um, <laughs> I like that. that. That movie is a beautiful movie. Uh, but that's a creepy scene. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was actually a movie that was uh, initially um, uh, contemplated by Stanley Kubrick of 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, but then had to be finished by Steven Spielberg because of Kubrick's death. But he, he, he was a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, but the whole concept here is, uh, and those of you who might remember the story, it's a family who have um, their own human child who's in a coma and believe that he'll never come out of it. So they adopt um, this android, David, who is a new model uh, of artificially intelligent being. And the idea is, is that if you develop these uh, androids as children, they will learn like human children and become just as intelligent. But that's a, a, a beautiful scene in the sense that you could see some of the challenges uh, I mean, whilst it might seem science fiction in terms of having android workers who are artificially intelligent, um, it's the interaction between 
complex human emotions and artificial intelligence, where artificial intelligence are great at um, producing a result or an outcome, but have not yet developed uh, a, a complex emotional understanding or framework. Um, you can see, whilst it was an amazing thing, it actually was quite a, an inappropriate thing to be doing at that time. <laughs> um, and that sort of takes us to where we are at the moment with artificial intelligence. Um, you might have heard about um, the moment of singularity or te technological singularity. Um, if you haven't, it's, <laughs> it's this prediction about when uh, machines, well, the, the, the processing power of a computer will be equivalent to the human brain in terms of its processing power. Uh, and so we reach a moment where, um, and the prediction is, uh, this was a prediction by Ray Kurzweil, that in his estimation it was 2025 that we would have a thousand dollar human brain computer. Uh, is that when we duck the cover because it becomes <laughs> super scary? Or? Well, um, I mean, that predict there's, there's different predictions. That some of the predictions are 2030 up to 2100. But, um, but that's looking at the diminishing cost of technology versus power. Um, so it is conceivable that, and at the moment we have reached sort of mouse brain power um, with computers. So to get beyond that is not inconceivable. And at the moment we're about 75% of the human nervous system in terms of computing power. And what's missing is the 25% frontal lobe emotional capacity power that humans have over their computers. So they're the future jobs, is the ones where you need to rely on that frontal lobe um, emotional intelligence. Uh, this is as AI as of last week. So um, you may have read, it's quite exciting news for Australia because this is the biggest investment that Boeing company has ever made outside of the US and it's to build um, what they call, well the, I think the media's called them loyal wingman drones, but they're uh, independently thinking aircraft that can fly at the same speed as jet fighter aircraft. So the idea is this will be a wingman to our new F-35 joint strike fighter capabilities. So, I mean, that's to think about the thinking involved in an aircraft to fly on its own and independently think. So there's no one operating it with a joystick anymore. Terrifying. <laughs> um, now, what about digitally cloning a chief economist? Yeah, I think this is spooky, but I was talking to Rob earlier about how this could be expanded into all sorts of areas. But uh, this is last year. This is last year. So UBS, um, the Swiss uh, banking in a, a business, decided that its chief economist, Daniel Kant, Kalt, um, wasn't available enough for everybody who needed him. So they've created a new digital avatar version of him, which is that picture there. Uh, it's a company called FaceMe uh, who have developed it. Uh, but basically it's for those clients who need him when the, the real Daniel Kalt's not available. They still charge for his time, but they're talking to a digital version of him. Essentially and he's pre-programmed, right? So <laughs> someone could be in the room and ask a question. Um, and it will give the answer that Daniel would have given. Um, well, it's a, he actually is drawing on the same technology, uh, which is the Watson IBM artificial intelligence. So you may have seen uh, how that machine won in jeopardy uh, about six years ago. Yeah, right. So it actually is able to independently... As in the game show on TV, right? Yeah. Yes, but that was seen to be... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, um, it, just for those that are, are younger than uh, <laughs> some of the others yeah. in the room. What's your point, Ron? So it isn't independent. <laughs> It is an independently thinking uh, <laughs> avatar designed to be able to answer questions that clients believe they need at any time of the day. What about an AI virtual assistant? Would it be ethical to not tell employees that they are working with AI IT support staff? Should it be a legal requirement? Well, Let's watch this, shall we? <laughs> Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Hello, can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, what time are you looking for, Will? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? 
depending on what service she would like. What service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. To give some context to what just happened, uh, Google announced that last year, and it's this new, um, essentially, assistant that they've introduced, understanding that one of the main things that businesses require is to make phone calls, book appointments, to do things like that, which are currently taken up by people. That was entirely artificial intelligence making a call, and as you can see, thinking on its feet, as it were, <laughs> or um, on its computer stand, uh, in order to take the conversation in a way that was unanticipated. So. We're actually not that far away from, uh, from that capability in the workplace. Now, Ryan, what if you could teach your AI assistant to conduct a redundancy discussion using an avatar on screen? Again, clearly this is going to be a bit movie heavy. Who's seen this particular one? This is a good one. This is up in the air. My name is Ms. Keener, and I'm here today to talk about your options. I worked for this company for 17 years, and they sent a fourth grader to can me. perfectly normal to be upset. However, the sooner you can tell yourself that greater opportunities are greater waiting for opportunities. you. Opportunities, I'm 50 <laughs> Whoever built an empire or changed the world sat where you are now. And it's because they sat there that they were able to do it. There's a packet in front of you. I want you to take some time and review it. All the answers you're looking for are inside those pages. So what's interesting about that clip is she's the new sort of star intern for the company. She's actually been taught that routine by the George Clooney character because that's the way he's always done it, old school face to face. She's now introduced this idea of it was sort of new back in 20 years ago when the film came out, uh, of conducting a remote um, sort of screen-based redundancy with the idea that you could sit anywhere in, in the country and not be in the same room. The funny thing about that scene is they're actually one room away from the actual person because they're not sure how to manage the situation. So, um, but our hypothetical here is imagine if you had the UBS Daniel Pelt avatar as the person conducting it. Um, working to the rules. So, time for your poll, everybody. Here's the question. Do, 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 do. If available, would you use artificial intelligence to inform an employee that their job has been terminated? Would you use artificial intelligence to tell an employee <laughs> that their job has been terminated? I was like, uh, could you just repeat the question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just preempting. It was great. That was my emotional intelligence yeah, response. Yes, taking over. It was fantastic. All right. Okay. What do people think? Nope. Yeah, I'm probably a bit of a nope. What have we got? Definitely much easier than telling them in person. <laughs> yeah, I don't imagine that's a very fun discussion to have. I feel like that's someone that might have had a similar discussion recently and, and didn't enjoy yeah. how it went. Those meetings require a level of emotional intelligence that computers don't have. Look, and fundamentally, I think that is what everybody's... Um, response to artificial intelligence is that surely there's going to be a disconnect between a human's capacity to read emotions versus a computer's capacity to read emotions. But this is where it's really interesting talking about machine learning and learning mm. um, cues. Mm. Yeah, and in essence you could, you could actually have an avatar learning those same rules on behaviour and uh, accepting that there will be certain emotional responses that they'll have to adapt to. But it's probably still not appropriate. Yeah. Yes. And it is terrifying. Um, so you think this is all science fiction, but um, and you may have read my article about this already, but in the United States, um, although a um, robot or avatar hasn't taken someone's job, it's actually resulted in dismissing somebody already. Um, uh, in this case, it wasn't true AI, 
it was uh, Mr. Diallo, uh, that's the dashing picture of him there, uh, who worked in the IT industry as a coder himself, so he was a victim of uh, his own processes perhaps, <laughs> where he turned up one morning, couldn't get in using his access pass. Um, that triggered a whole lot of alerts to the company that somebody with an invalid pass was trying to access. Um, after security came down and he verified that he was still working for the company, they let him in. He then tried to log into his computer in the morning, uh, as he did every morning, didn't work. He then had to talk to someone in, who managed the IT system to get him in. Uh, but that triggered a whole lot of other processes. Um, by the time lunchtime came around, a security guard came to his desk and walked him out of the building saying, and then um, he wasn't able to get back into work for three weeks because <laughs> nobody knew what had happened and the computer systems in the building just assumed that he was no longer employed. So, in a way, it was a constructive dismissal, but without any human intervention at all. Mm. And it took three weeks for a human being to work out what had happened. Terrifying. Mm. So that's in the context of terminating. Um, Amazon got itself into a bit of a bit of hot water in relation to recruitment and trying to use artificial intelligence. Ryan, are you able to talk us through this one? Yeah, they did. Um, they Obviously, Amazon, quite a, a desirable company to work for in the tech space, were getting thousands and thousands of resumes for, for particular roles. And so they thought, would it be, it'd be great if we had some machine to, to cull through these? Uh, so it takes the data of the last 10 years of, of well-performing Amazon employees and, and started to cull. What they realised was that it was culling disproportionately and very much so culling women more than men. Uh, and in the tech space at the moment, there is, it's more male dominated and more male heavy. And so the machine had learnt that, well, that must make a, a better employee and so had been recommending more men for jobs. So the, the AI had learnt to become sexist. Um, it, and it actually speaks to a, a problem that's, that's kind of broader with AI is that they learn, but they learn from something. Yes. And, and so they're learning from either people or from data or whatever that's being inputted into them. Um, and so if there's a problem with that data, then the machines are going to learn that problem. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Well, it's, the data is accurate, except sure, that sure. what it is, is it's, it, it's evidence of historical discrimination. Yeah, mm. and, yeah. and so it is learning from a history of discrimination and is not aware, like we are, that there is a need to overcome that historic discrimination. Which is a beautiful segue, Darren, yes. into this very question. So what is happening in terms of regulation of AI? Yes, well, um, remarkably, and I, I don't know whether people have seen the white paper and discussion paper, but the Australian Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission late last year identified this as an emerging area where a human rights approach to regulating or governing the advancement of technology is probably needed. We're reaching that time in history now where human life and human rights are being affected adversely by technology. So whilst, whilst the report recognises that technology is a fantastic enabler for many people, and particularly women in terms of accessing education in remote parts of the world, or for people with disabilities who have a technological um, level playing field overcoming hearing loss or loss of a limb or impaired vision. Um, it also presents, uh, as we've touched on, mm. some great concerns in terms of the effect on human rights and discrimination. So uh, there actually is, uh, if you're really interested, like, uh, like you should be, mm. uh, there's an opportunity by the end of this week to put in submissions on the topic uh, and there's a plan to have a full final report released late this year or early 2020 by the Human Rights Commission addressing some of these issues um, which are real. Um, mm. when I, what I find interesting about this topic is when I went to law school um, and all, all the, the law was concerned about, particularly in employment law, was decisions made by humans because mm. companies don't make decisions, human beings within a company do. But we're now in a, in a realm already where it's not humans making decisions, it's processes that companies have put in place. So arguably the company itself as a legal person is making decisions and can be liable for those decisions directly without any human involvement at all, except the human beings affected by the decision. Mm. And for those people who are out there thinking, 
artificial intelligence is not something that is going to infiltrate my business anytime soon. Um, it's certainly the case that other forms of technology are increasingly being used um, by human resources departments, particularly around recruitment practices. So we talked about uh, social media stalking, for example. So the next topic that we wanted to address was data mining. Um, and basically, what can you do? What is appropriate? What's going too far? Another clip, check this out, and then we'll explain. Congratulations. What about the interview? That was it. <laughs> Casual bit of urine testing for our breakfast seminar. Yes, <laughs> Who's seen Gattaca? Brilliant see film. It. Terrifying, but brilliant. I actually, it, urine's already come up in my discussion this morning over breakfast. <laughs> 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 One of my clients, uh, and perhaps some of you, do, do urine testing already in terms of drug and alcohol testing. Um, and if you haven't seen Gattaca, I don't want to ruin it, but uh, it's all about uh, a world where uh, there are valids and invalids or perfect or imperfect human beings. And what's, it, it's actually a beautiful film that was not big at the box office but should, have, should be big in your um, repertoire of films in that um, it, it, it involved so that Jerome, the character there, was actually using a urine sample from uh, someone who he had brokered a deal with to acquire his DNA on a regular <coughs> basis uh, who happened to be in a wheelchair. So it's a nice, mm. it's a film about the future, but also cuts across the themes of disability, work, and privacy, and, and the issues of data. Um, and the reason that he, he's going for his dream job, working for a new, um, ast a new aeronautical business to fly up into the space. But the, the, the man who he acquires the DNA from is genetically superior intellectually and, mm. and actually athletically but for having been in a car accident where he's now wheelchair bound and will never get a job. So um, I think it's an interesting film because of that intersection of um, disability and technology, mm. both being a potential enabler but also a disabler for people. And that's what, um, that's what the Human Rights Commission has picked up on too. There's a growing uh, gap between those who can access technology and those who can't. Mm. Um, and now, just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people have used DNA sampling in recruitment? <laughs> Not so much. All right, so a poll that may have a more live example for you to consider. Should an employer research a prospective employee's social media presence when considering whether to offer that employee a job? Do, 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 do. Yeah, All right, slide, here we go. That, yeah. What do people think? <laughs> nice one. Bit of movement on that one. Sure, why not? No, that's private. I mean, that, no, that's private is an interesting question, though. If it's social media and you can access it by Googling, is it private? Mm. Yeah, I always think of, uh, on that question, I, I had an interesting case once which involved somebody working in the public sector, but on their social media had an existence which was quite abhorrent to most. They belonged to an outlaw motorcycle gang that was called the Fourth Reich. Um, and, and so the imagery that he had was fairly uh, neo-Nazi, right, mm. for most people not acceptable. Um, what the employer didn't like was the association between his private life and the public life he had um, and the interface that he had to have with law enforcement and also community expectations that when you get looked after in this uh, particular public service, mm. you're being treated fairly and not being discriminated or judged. Yeah. Um, and so there was questions about, well, is, is that person's private life? And there's... He, he had strong beliefs about riding motorbikes and the freedom of doing so mm. and associating with whomever he wished to associate <coughs> with. But there were valid concerns about how does that affect our reputational interests in the community. Mm. 
Absolutely. Look, and it is the case that there are quite a number of laws which can be relevant to these sorts of activities. Um, Ryan, did you want to kick off with some of the... Yeah, well, I mean, you might think that if, if someone's put the photos on their Facebook or their Instagram or something like that, it's in, it's in a public place and so therefore you're allowed in terms of privacy laws to, to take that. But what if those photos reveal something, for example, um, I don't know, that they might be wearing a, a shirt from a particular union and you might be a particularly unionised workforce already and um, what if that plays into your decision? Obviously, that's not allowed under, under the, the workplace laws, the general protections of the Fair Work Act. Or, or obviously, what if, if um, through the pictures it becomes clear the particular race or um, the particular, particular marital status of the individual or, um, or gender or anything along those lines, um, it perhaps opens up things that might not be revealed in a, in a job interview. Mm. Um, and so you, you just need to be careful the reasons that you're making decisions um, and whether or not there's an argument from the prospective employee that the reasons were actually something untoward based on what they have on their social media presence. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Darren, did you want to comment on uh, the Privacy Act at all in terms of uh, the operation of the employee records exemption in this space? Yes. Uh, well, um, it's an exemption for employee records, not for prospective employee yeah, records. So sure. um, there's a big danger, particularly in the recruitment process, to be doing a bit of background research online to validate some candidate's sort of uh, assertions or representations about their background or their experience. Uh, particularly if you do find something that doesn't assist their application, what do you do with it? And can you rely on it? Um, it, it would arguably be caught up in the regime mm, and you would absolutely. need to comply and probably would have had to have made sure that on their application form, there was some form of consent, which could be difficult to craft in terms of being able to um, look further into and check their personal information. Absolutely. Question from the floor. Uh, can I, uh, I just had a, uh, an interesting email yesterday and I'm sure that many of the HR people in the room get these regularly. It was from a company, oh, thanks, Anna. It was from a company doing a pre-employment screening check and uh, what they were asking uh, for was, was rather interesting. They were asking about this person's uh, record of employment with us but in particular whether there were any performance management issues, warnings issued and, and so on and so forth. And it just turns out this particular person was an extremely difficult person and duplicitous and we had enormous problems with her some years ago, I might add. Uh, they also forwarded a consent form from this person who, who signed and authorised them to carry out the background check. But I mean, I'm at odds as to how to respond. I feel really conflicted. Is this uh, more commonplace now in, in, in the industry? Yes, it's certainly more commonplace and it is presenting some moral and ethical dilemmas, as well as legal dilemmas. I mean, I've, I, we're involved in a matter at the moment where the, very, the, the employee exited under a deed of release that promised um, confidentiality and non-disparagement. The, the question being raised is a mere response to a question, would you employ this person again, where the answer was in the negative, was that a disparaging comment? Mm. And, I mean, arguably I'd say no, because... Uh, but, but it implies that they didn't leave voluntarily. Mm. So um, it, it's difficult. And whilst you might have some comfort with their signed consent, how can you be sure that they were fully aware that that would be the depth of information requested mm. of you? Yeah, and that is a challenge as well with the signed consent. So if somebody has suggested to you that this third party signed it, how do we know that that person did sign it? And yeah. those sorts of... Yeah. Mm. There's big questions too about where these companies reside and is it just a call centre in somewhere in the uh, Are you Southeast actually Asia? talking to yeah. artificial intelligence? Are you talking about artificial intelligence? <laughs> well, there are, some, there are some data mining reference checking companies that are bots. So you have to be really careful. All right, moving along then to uh, what you can be doing in the workplace to actually managing, uh, manage some of these risks. So social media policies? What's your view? 
I think it's, it's always a good idea to have some form of guidance in the workplace. And so whilst we've got a few very simple tips there, um, it is a fundamental question. Do you wish to have policy that governs this issue or not? Mm. Um, mm. I, I think usually having something that sets uh, clear values and expectations is always better than employees not being sure what your policy is. Or, more importantly, new recruits who may feel very uncomfortable with the fact that you might know about what they do on the weekend already without having asked them. Moving swiftly along, CCTV and workplace surveillance. If you've ever had the experience of uh, defending an unfair dismissal application, um, you always have a barrister that will say, oh, is there any CCTV footage of what <laughs> happened? Um, and obviously, nine times out of ten, the answer is no. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to answer positively, yes, there is CCTV footage in a case that we ran a couple of years ago with Dylan and Sydney trains. Um, and this involved a particular guard who had been cleaning a train um, now, part of the guard's role was that they would do sweeps of the trains and if they found any lost property, <coughs> they would then have to hand in that lost property with a view to trying to find the owner of that lost property. Um, and this particular gentleman on this particular occasion um, is seen on the screen leaning down towards what is quite clearly a mobile telephone. And then he stands up and the mobile telephone is no longer there. So the inference that can be drawn from that particular piece of footage is that he is the reason why that particular mobile phone device is no longer there. We went to an unfair dismissal hearing because he said, oh, no, 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 I must have accidentally kicked it under the seat. And that's why it's no longer there. Um, given all of the particular circumstances, the Commission didn't actually accept his explanation and so we were successful relying on the CCTV footage and being able to demonstrate that the dismissal was fair in the circumstances. But will CCTV footage always be admissible in unfair dismissal proceedings? And what are the trips and challenges that we need to know about? Absolutely. Well, there's a case there, um, Markovic and, and Krav Maga defence, and where in the midst of an appeal for this right now, so the, the permission to appeal has been granted and the actual substantive appeal is to come. Um, but if you want to flick to the next slide there, Amber, there's, most of you would be aware that there's an act in New South Wales called the Workplace Surveillance Act. Um, essentially, there's requirements and, and, and loops that you need to jump through if you are going to be able to surveil your employees. One of those is to have signage at the, um, at, at the entrance of the place to say that um, you'll be conducting workplace surveillance. This case that is in the, in the throes of being argued um, involves a self-defence studio um, under the, um, the style Krav Maga, which is very, it's like an Israeli um, defence. Um, I'll give you some examples if you want, but we'll, we'll save that for later. But um, the, the, the rough situation was the CCTV footage caught this employee always on his phone. Um, and allowing the students to spar and to essentially fight each other without proper supervision, which is very dangerous, of course. Um, they had no choice, really, but to dismiss this employee, despite the fact that the actual employee and the owner were good friends from back in Israel and served in the armed forces together, apparently. Um, the question comes up, well, they didn't have that sign, and so they were um, arguably in contravention of the Workplace Surveillance Act, and so therefore is the Fair Work Commission mm -hmm allowed to consider it. The employee said no. The, um, the workplace tried to rely on one of the exemptions, which says that it was for another reason. It wasn't actually to surveil employees. And they said that there was consent with the employee because he could see it and he knew the cameras were there. Um, the commissioner, Commissioner Reardon, actually decided that, well, I, he, he was calling it illegal footage. He's like, I can't take into account illegal footage. Mm. Um, and so therefore, uh, that was only a jurisdictional hearing, but therefore, um, I'm not going to just knock it out on the basis of the CCTV footage because you've got a bigger case to answer here because I can't consider that CCTV footage. Mm. That's what's under appeal. And it's the idea that if, um, if something comes to the um, attention of the business, but perhaps there was a breach of legislation in getting that material, whether it's CCTV footage, we'll talk about 
um, other listening mm. devices um, shortly. Um, but the Fair Work Commission has decided we need to consider this because we're not a court that's bound by evidence. We're a commission uh, and we're allowed, we've got broad powers to inform ourselves of things that have happened in the workplace mm. that would affect these cases. Um, so keep your, mind, keep your eye on it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming shortly one. and it will have broad implications, not just workplace surveillance, but lots of laws. Indeed, that's a perfect segue to other implications, which can be mobile smart devices. So as we discussed from the outset, what we know is um, your iPhone or other smartphone has the capacity to take video clips, it has the capacity to record. Uh, what implications does this actually have for the workplace? I, I'm, I'm a great lover of IT history and if you pull out your phone, what, it's here, it, it's got more processing power than all of the NASA computers for the moon landing in 1969. Um, or Fun fact, everybody. <laughs> Fun fact. Also, uh, an Apple iPhone 4, which very few people still have, has more processing power than a Cray supercomputer, which when I was a kid was the ultimate computer you could get in the world. <laughs> okay, moving from fun fact, uh, so mobile devices. Well, the reason I made that, Amber, is we were talking about CCTV, which might, some people might say is old school technology. Because yeah. what's happening in workplaces now is that the employer is not conducting the surveillance, it's employees surveilling each other mm. or surveilling their own employer with their smart device. So what are the rules around listening devices in the workplace, Darren? Well, interestingly, the Workplace Surveillance Act only applies to employers conducting surveillance. So um, it doesn't regulate what employees do to their employer. However, there are, there are other um, pieces of legislation to consider, um, including um, its Surveillance uh, Devices Act in New South Wales and Commonwealth, and also listening devices legislation that exists. Uh, in essence, uh, and you may have been aware of this sort of generally um, prohibition on um, covert or secret recordings of conversations without someone else's consent. But that's not the full story. Mm. There's an exemption. And mm. that exemption is that if a person is party to that conversation themselves, um, and they believe that it's reasonably necessary for the protection of their lawful interests to record that conversation, they can do so without letting the other person know. What does that mean? Well, <laughs> there's, been, there's been some cases about what that means and it's a very broad exemption depending on what the person believes their legitimate lawful interests are. Mm. But you can imagine in, for example, a general protections case, it could be a very broad belief mm. of what is necessary to protect their lawful interests. And just a quick show of hands for a moment. Um, has anybody ever been in a performance management meeting where the employee has indicated that they're going to record it on their phone? Mm. And I'm interested, is someone willing to say how you responded to that? Did you oppose that request? Did you go with the flow? You, you oppose the request? I, I oppose it. I just said I wasn't, I'm not a party to you recording it and I don't authorise it. Yep, okay, yep. And they turned it off. And they did turn it off. And that's the interesting thing. So in, in, in that particular context, you were at least given um, a choice. There was a discussion. But obviously, it remains that an employee could simply walk into that meeting, switch it on, and you wouldn't know. Um, so it is a real live issue. I, I like to, as a lawyer, I like to think, what is the public policy or interest in not recording things as, it, as they happen? Mm, that's and what is, what is the reason for it? Um, as the best I can rationalise is that in an employment context, it's a loss of conf conf trust and confidence that you need to have in people. If they believe they have to record everything, it's not a very trusting relationship. Mm. But it's an interesting question to think about. Why is it that you cannot rely on a recording of something that actually happened in real life? Because in theory, someone might be able to take perfect notes. Mm. And what's yeah. the difference? Uh, and they... and uh, more interestingly, what if... Uh, I've got an uncle who's got a perfect memory. He can remember everything verbatim. So is it to overcome the disability that the rest of us have with <laughs> yeah. poor yeah. memory? Right? Yeah, that's right. But it, it's not just necessarily recording now, Amber. I see you've gone to this slide. Mm. Everyone, everyone's <coughs> seen those Apple AirPods. Lots of people have them now. The, uh, the iPhone earphones, essentially, that aren't, um, aren't restricted by a cord. 
the latest iOS update, iOS 12, I think it is, comes with the ability, and, and it's good, I think, intentions behind it in order to assist people with difficulty listening, but you could place your iPhone, for example, over where Amber is, and within a radius of about 15 metres, there's this function called listening live. I can listen live to what's happening over there as if I'm next to Amber, but I might be 15 metres away. The purpose for assisting people that might have difficulty hearing, the reality, that's now a problem if someone leaves their phone in a disciplinary meeting after they walk out and can listen potentially to exactly what you're saying. Now, it might not be a problem if everything's above board, but what happens <laughs> if they bust in and say, hey, how dare you say that you'd already made your decision? And then that, that becomes a difficulty in, in dismissal type situations. Um. And so, can recording a private conversation be grounds for dismissal? So I guess this feeds into your point, Darren, about whether what? there's a loss of trust. That's right. So, and that's, that's essentially what Commissioner Williams decided in that Western Australian case. You'll see that's 2012. And that generally is, uh, I, suppose, I suppose, prevailing um, theory and, and thoughts on the area. Deputy President Gostensnik has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works last November mm. in this decision here where it was decided that essentially a very complicated factual scenario, more complicated than I can go into, but take it down and have a look at the decision. It's a Yarra Trams decision. The employee was sacked, good record, 40 years of employment, um, and there were some allegations. And, and so when allegations started happening, um, started taking recordings, and the employer said, well, that kind of came up during the case. And they said, well, we would have sacked you anyway, and we don't want him reinstated because that's destroying our trust mm. and confidence in the employment relationship. But the deputy president said, no, nah, I'm not convinced that that's sufficient in, in these cases because um, he, he relied on the, the idea that it was to protect his lawful and reasonable interests. And mm. so said that, well, if it's allowed legally and if he gets into that, then how could it be um, in breach of the trust and confidence? He's allowed to do it. Mm. So... I'd be interested in what the full bench says about that. If that, I don't think it would get appealed. We're, we're out of time now, but if it comes up again, mm. but certainly there is at least one deputy president in the Fair Work Commission that says it's not a breach of the trust and confidence relationship. Yeah, okay, interesting. Let's talk about technology for a moment and the extent to which we can actually rely on it. Um, so here's a poll. You've been shown a video on an employee's smartphone of one employee verbally abusing another. The video appears to have been taken without consent. Can the business use that recording as part of an unfair, uh, sorry, as part of an investigation and potentially as evidence in unfair dismissal proceedings? So it's been taken without consent, but it appears to be pretty clear evidence of wrongdoing and something that would be a sackable offence, can you use that and rely on it? Here we go. I don't know, that's why I'm here. That's my answer, is that a problem? I don't know. Definitely, it's clear evidence of abuse in the workplace is getting a good run. That seems to be that seems to be the winner. Oh, we've got one in the B. Oh, <laughs> but dun, dun, dun. are we entering a new era of questionable authenticity of video evidence? Watch this. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know. Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. <laughs> now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but <laughs> someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is how spooky is that? Crazy. And, and this technology is now available on consumer-grade you know, PCs. Ten years ago, you'd have to f spend a few million dollars and get uh, a cinema um, digital effects CG company to do it. Mm. But now you can do it at home. So, and this is technology that was available a year ago, yeah. and it's getting better and better to the point where people can now insert moving images of sports people um, pretending to be Roger Federer playing tennis, but it's... 
it's actually they've mapped themselves over the top. And it looks, it's very, very you, they actually have to use AI now to detect whether or not videos online are real. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's the issue of authenticity. Um, but then what about just the issue of if it has been a covert recording, can it be used? Yeah, and, and it's, uh, as often happens, there's different people go different views based on the, um, the circumstances. Um, that first case there was an interlocutory um, application where the judge decided that it wasn't able to be used um, for purposes of what the status quo was and maintaining it. So a bit of a different bar to what a full argument would be. In those two other cases, um, the parties actually uh, consented to using it, interestingly, because both of them thought it served their case in each mm. of the cases. Um, but Commissioner Reardon, who is the same commissioner that um, decided that the workplace surveillance footage couldn't be used as a real thing for privacy, decided that um, if you hadn't both consented, I'd have real difficulty with this. Um, interesting factual scenario about the first one is it was a security guard that had a little um, lapel and he wasn't involved in the conversation. Um, it was a conversation where two individuals, or one individual in particular, had made quite racist remarks, very colourful language in relation to some senior people in the business. And the security guard kind of had shimmied over and uh, had been surreptitiously recording that. So that one wasn't allowed in. Um, as I said, it was an interlocutory. So it's, it's interesting whether or not we could use that in the future. But mm. um, it's certainly... Uh, it certainly is not an easy answer, um, and perhaps you might want to get advice about it. <laughs> yes, yeah. great idea, Ryan. Great sell. Well, I, I just wanted to take it to the limit, as I like to do. And um, there actually are, and Elon Musk is one of these investors, looking at augmenting human memory and capacity. So, in essence, having uh, technology inserted into your body that will allow you to basically video record live events, store it, as you would on your phone, but it also interacts with your brain. So you actually are augmenting your memory capacity. And then there's, there'll be interesting <laughs> questions about, well, look, if you're actually just, if you're just giving evidence based on what you've actually seen, and it's simply a recording of your, that what you have seen and your memory of it is more reliable than a natural memory, what's wrong with it? Um, why can't you rely on that as your memory? Sounds like science fiction, but give it 10, 15 years. There'll be people who will be arguing these points. It's rough for your uncle that we're all coming up to his level now, though. That's yeah, my, my <laughs> uncle, who does have a perfect memory, I think has a huge advantage, and all of us are probably technically disabled to him. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're just going to move then to what our final topic is, and I'm just conscious of the time, so we might just move to the poll. So the question for the poll is this. Is it reasonable to require employees to scan their fingerprint as a method of clocking on? So we're familiar with the Bundy clock. Um, if an organisation introduces a system where you actually have to give a fingerprint scan, and that's what they're applying to all employees, is it reasonable to require the employee to engage in that fingerprint process under threat of dismissal if they don't? Is it a lawful and reasonable direction? This is a super interesting one. This is a real live case, everybody. Over to you, Ryan. People are doing this because in the old Bundy system where you, you could actually borrow someone's card and have them clock out for you. So the idea behind it is, well, you're using somebody's natural biometric data to guarantee it's the actual person clocking on and off. Which, for those of you who want to watch Gadiga, there's a great oh, way to overcome that. <laughs> and the Fair Work I Ombudsman... I had the clip, I had the clip. The Fair Work Ombudsman is requiring this in certain circumstances, Amber, because, for example, some of the big franchised companies where there are difficulties about, whether, about how much time people are working, this is seen as a way to overcome that. Too true. And, and as was the case here with Superior Wood, um, a sawmill company, Mr Lee was, was one of their workers, one of about 400 employees, um, Superior, Superior Wood was one in a group, one company in a group of about six. Five of those companies had implemented fingerprint scanning, no objections from any employees. 400 employees in this company said that's all right, but Mr Lee said, no, I'm, I'm scared about you guys having my private data, and indeed not just you, but you're kind of subcontracting someone else's technology and they're having my private data. Mm. So he argued that the employee 
records exemption didn't apply anyway because it wasn't the employer that was holding the information. Yes, yes. Um, so they said, well, we've got this policy, we're implementing it for payroll. There's also safety reasons because if something happens and we need to evacuate the site in an instant on our phones, we can see exactly who's on site because they've all fingerprinted on in the morning. And he said, I don't care, I'll do a Bundy card, I'll sign on as I used to, but I don't trust you with my private information. Mm. Um, the company ended up dismissing him because they said it was a lawful and reasonable direction to require him to do this in accordance with the policy the same way all the other employees did. Uh, and the Fair Work Commission found that it was a lawful and reasonable direction mm. and his dismissal was not unfair. That's gone to appeal and in the same, actually the same full bench as the other appeal which is pending have decided permission to appeal is to be granted uh, and we're just waiting to hear. Um, but it's big implications. What can you take from employees? What is a lawful and reasonable direction? Big implications, but in our fast-moving technological world, will it potentially become redundant? This is the technological fix to fingerprints. Yeah. Why even bother asking people to put their finger on something? You just take a scan of their face. Um, and this is real. In, there's, a, a, there's a new startup company, software automation company, Mag, Magvi in China, who's doing just this. So every, every morning when people walk into the gate, they get their face scanned, they've clocked on. Every morning when they walk out, at our afternoon when they walk out, their get, face gets scanned, that's them clocking off. No need for fingerprints at all. Is everybody feeling suitably terrified? <laughs> Be afraid. Um, can I throw it to the crowd for questions? I think we've got a roving mic. It all sounds a bit like that. It all sounds a bit like, like Black Mirror to me. Um, <laughs> One of the questions I had was going back to the Amazon and the AI that was gender bias. Um, I note that in a number of states in the US, including um, New York, that you're no longer permitted during the interview process to ask somebody's salary because it's uh, repeating the history of gender bias and there's been uh, mm. obviously a gap and that gets expanded in each new role. What are your views as the panel about whether this is an effective thing and how easy it is to, to police, I guess? I've, like, personally, I've never thought asking for somebody's salary is helpful in any way because why are you asking other than to perhaps get a gauge for their expectation mm. the better question is what's your salary expectation mm. <laughs> uh, and but uh, it's a good point and, and and it's valid because it's the same historical discrimination that is perpetuating itself mm. um, particularly if if you're a female and have had broken work experience and work in an industry that historically has underpaid women to men and there's uh, we had our International Women's Day function here for our staff yesterday, which still shows there's a, a significant pay gap in most industry sectors in Australia and around the world. And there's very few countries in the world that has pay parity, if any. Uh, perhaps Iceland is one of the few. So it would be uh, a legitimate concern and a reason not to be collecting that data. Mm. Uh, Absolutely. As to how to police. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the candidate could dob, couldn't they? I was asked a question. Mm. Well, and the effective counter is social media where people will, will yeah, call out yeah. companies that have those sorts of questions mm. and let everyone else in the potential candidate pool know. Do we have any other questions from the floor? I recognise that guy. Yes. I, I, I do want to ask a question, it, and particularly in the area of these covert surveillance, as you might call it, um, where employees record things occurring, and the whole debate as to whether an employer can use it, and how that interacts with work health safety obligations. In an era where you've got to ensure safety, uh, prevent bullying, ensure a, a positive workplace culture, is there a disharmony between where the debate's heading and these very serious work health safety obligations? It's a good question. It wasn't even a, a, a Dorothy Dixon one. It was <laughs> a genuine one. Uh, my view has always been that if you have any evidence, no matter uh, whether or not at, in a court of law it may be admissible or not, but as an employer where you're just bound by um, the rules of being a reasonable, common sense, good manager, if you have evidence that you believe exposes employees to a risk to their health and safety, whether it be a physical safety risk, or a psychological risk because of bullying and harassment, you can't ignore it. Now, it may be that you look for other evidence to verify 
that it's true. Mm. So mm. if somebody's showing you a video of a sparking cable, you probably would go and check to see whether or not it's an actual sparking cable mm. or have a qualified electrician to do so. So my, my advice has always been, look, uh, if you've got some questionable questions about the reliability or authenticity of one form of evidence, it doesn't mean you ignore it. You might need just to go and make sure you've got some other forms of evidence to um, supplement it mm. and to actually get a better idea. I mean, CCTV footage, video camera footage, is notoriously difficult to rely on in courts because you've got a fixed point of view, um, mm. often people out of the frame are missing, so the material witnesses, other events that happened before and after aren't on there. Um, there's a whole re chain of reasons why it's not the best evidence, even though th people think it is, it's not the best evidence at all. Mm. Audio is notoriously bad, mm. um, colours are not genuine um, in the sense that a phone has reproduced a colour uh, and actually one of my earliest work health safety cases involved a digital photograph. This is how long ago it was, it was <laughs> new. <laughs> and the then WorkSafe, which is Safe Work, um, put it into the brief of evidence, but the colour match, it looked like a blood red colour, but when we went to the factory floor it was a fluorescent red. Um, the, the brief looked as though it was a pool of blood. Uh, simply because whoever did the colour rendering on the photograph got it wrong. Wow. And they actually did yeah. think it was a blood pool when in fact it was a safety marker for not to go there. Mm. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful with assuming that what you're seeing as a digitised version of reality is true. I'm conscious of the time, so we might wrap it up there. But of course if you do have questions, feel free to come down and approach the panel. So thank you. Um, for joining us today and please uh, assist me with thanking our panellists. Stay tuned um, for details of our next seminar. You'll have a pack there. There's a feedback form. Also let us know if there are any particular topics that keep emerging in your workplace that you think would make the great topic for one of these sessions. And thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much.